Hello everyone. So this session is going to be on, uh, I'm going to start with organ system now. Uh, of course, initially ma main thing is brain, brain and immune system. So today I will uh, discuss uh, just, a, you know, uh, uh, anatomy of brain and function of brain. I'll also talk about neurotransmitters. Uh, because it's important, uh, neurotransmitters are very important when I speak about, you know, mental health, uh, stress, addiction, you know. So I want you to understand what those neurotransmitters are. Uh, and then, of course, uh, immune system, because um, uh, immune system really depends upon uh, your nutrition that you eat, you know, your metabolic health, uh, environment. Uh, so I will also kind of teach you just basics of, immune system not too much in detail but you need to know a few things okay so here is basically organ system is you know of course we already discussed about cell cell biology and mitochondria and organelles and how it generates ATP but now we're going to discuss more about the uh, organ system so you have nervous system you have respiratory system you have gastrointestinal uh, system you know you have uh, basically uh, you know uh, musculoskeletal system so there are all these different uh, uh, organ system okay so today we'll focus on brain uh, and your um, uh, nervous system includes your brain and spinal cord uh, I'm going to focus more on brain uh, today so what is the function of brain, okay? Uh, function of brain is basically it controls your thought, it, it basically controls your memory, emotions, touch, motor skills, vision, breathing, temperature, your hunger and every process that regulates our body, okay? So this are all uh, uh, kind of mechanisms uh, which are controlled by uh, your brain. Okay, uh, what is the weight of the brain? Uh, it weighs about 3 pounds, uh, which is about 1.2, uh, 1.3 kg. Uh, and it is about, brain is about 60% fat. So your brain predominantly is made from fat. Okay, so fat is extremely important, specifically for uh, young children, when uh, your myelination is occurring in those young children, when uh, babies being formed in the womb, uh, it's important for mothers to have enough amount of fat because that fat is uh, kind of, uh, you know, extracted for formation of brain and neural tubes and, you know, a lot of other myelinations also. The remaining 40% is combination of water, protein, carbohydrate and salts, okay? The brain itself is not a muscle. It contains blood vessels, it contains nerves, it includes neurons and glial cells, okay. Uh, so here is your uh, human nervous system. Uh, it shows the cross section of uh, your uh, brain, okay. Uh, here there are all these different uh, lobes, okay. Uh, your, uh, you know, hypothalamus, thalamus, uh, you know, your uh, midbrain, your uh, hind brain, which is your cerebellum. So again, you know, you have all this uh, different uh, parts. So I'll go in detail. Uh, here, let's uh, look at this uh, video because it will give us a general idea of... The brain is the most complex organ in the human body. As part of the nervous system, the brain coordinates all of the body's functions. In adult humans, the brain is a three-pound gelatinous mass of fat and protein. It's comprised of four main regions, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the brainstem, and the diencephalon, and each one controls specific tasks. The largest section is the cerebrum, and it makes up over three quarters of the brain's volume. It consists of neurons and nerve fibers that transmit information from the neurons throughout the brain and body. The cerebrum controls higher functions such as learning, reasoning, and speech, plus senses like sight and hearing. Under the cerebrum is the second largest part of the brain, the cerebellum. Much like the cerebrum, the cerebellum has nerve cells and nerve fibers. It carries signals to other parts of the brain and the spinal cord. The cerebellum is responsible for coordinating muscle movements, particularly those that help maintain the body's balance and posture. The third region, the brainstem, lies in front of the cerebellum and anchors the brain to the spinal cord. 
The brainstem is a collection of structures that include the pons, a mass of nerve fibers that carry sensory information, the midbrain, a region of fibers and structures that help control movement, along with auditory and visual processing, and the medulla oblongata, which creates motor and sensory pathways between the midbrain, the pons, and the spinal cord. Altogether, the parts of the brainstem control vital bodily functions, such as cardiac activity, respiration, digestion, and sleep. The fourth region is located above the brainstem and makes up the core of the brain, the diencephalon. About the size of an apricot, the diencephalon is a grouping of several structures. The thalamus, which processes and transmits information from all senses except smell, and the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, which work together to produce and regulate neurochemicals. These structures help govern sensations, weight regulation, energy, and instinctual behaviors, such as eating, drinking, and having sex. The brain's four main components, the diencephalon, brainstem, cerebellum, and cerebrum, work in sync to ensure bodily functions are fully operational. The brain has even evolved mechanisms to protect itself. One such mechanism is the blood-brain barrier, a semi-permeable cellular wall that only allows specific chemicals to enter from the body's bloodstream into the brain. Despite this protection, tumors and other complications can lead to life-threatening problems and diseases in the brain, such as dementia. Thankfully, scientists have found ways to improve brain health. Staying physically active and eating a balanced diet may preserve cognitive function and even reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's. So while the brain only makes up a small percentage of the body, it plays a crucial role in the body's functions and overall well-being. Now we go to next one. Uh, so here I'm going to explain to you, uh, you already saw how they look, uh, but here I'm going to explain to you in detail about human brain anatomy. Uh, so basically you have a frontal lobe, okay, you have a frontal which is in the front part of the uh, head, then you have a, a, a parietal lobe which is on the top, then you have a temporal lobe which is on the side, and then you have occipital lobe which is on the back of the head, okay. So these are the four uh, lobes which are shown. Your yellow, uh, sorry, the pink one is your frontal lobe. Uh, this frontal lobe is involved in personality characteristic, decision making and movement, recognition of smell. Uh, it also contains uh, Broca's area, frontal lobe is associated with speech ability also. Okay, uh, parietal lobe is which is on the top. It helps person identify objects and understand uh, spatial relationship where one's body is compared with an uh, object around the person. So the spatial relationship uh, is basically uh, controlled by parietal lobe. And then also uh, it involves in interpreting pain and touch in the body. Okay, And the parietal lobe houses Wernicke's uh, area which helps the brain understand spoken language. Okay, So the parietal lobe is important uh, basically to understand the spoken language. Uh, another one is your uh, occipital lobe which is uh, involved in vision, okay. Uh, then you have a temporal lobe, okay. Your temporal lobe uh, basically involves in short term memory, uh, speech, musical uh, rhythm and some degree of smell recognition, okay. And then you have uh, your cerebellum and your spinal cord, okay. So this is your basic uh, understanding of lobes. Then you have uh, areas okay, that you uh, saw in the previous video uh, called diencephalon. So I'm going to go a little bit detail on the diencephalon. Uh, your pituitary gland uh, basically is um, a part of your diencephalon. So you can see that over here there is a kind of piece shaped uh, body uh, that is your uh, pituitary gland and uh, sometimes called the master gland. It is a pea-sized uh, structure and found deep in the brain behind the bridge of the nose. So it, it is present just behind the bridge of the nose. It governs the function of other glands in the body, regulating the flow of hormones from thyroid, adrenals, ovaries and testicles. Okay, So it governs the function of other glands in the body. Uh, then it also 
uh, it is in uh, then there is a hypothalamus so hypothalamus regulates body temperature uh, it synchronizes sleep pattern and it controls hunger and thirst okay so very important uh, part of brain hypothalamus uh, and it also plays role in some aspect of memory and emotions then you have another uh, uh, area called amygdala now, amygdala is present uh, in uh, basically you can see it over here uh, just uh, again like a round shaped structure amygdala is small almond shaped structure uh, it is located under each half uh, each half of the brain it included uh, in limbic system the amygdala regulate emotions and memory okay uh, and are associated with brain's reward system stress and fight and flight so your amygdala is involved in your stress uh, you know your fight and flight reaction okay uh, then you have hippocampus hippocampus remember that hippocampus is important for memory learning navigation and perception of spaces uh, and it uh, receives information from the cerebral cortex and may play a role in alzheimer's disease okay uh, then you have pineal gland uh, pineal gland is very important because it secretes uh, melatonin uh, and it basically this gland responds to light and dark and secretes melatonin which regulates circadian rhythm and the sleep wake, -wake cycle okay uh, and remember that you need uh, increased uh, amount of melatonin at night to put you to sleep and there are various factors which can affect this melatonin uh, increase. Uh, so you want to, again, when I talk about sleep management and uh, stress management, that melatonin will come in. Um, also the uh, blue light, blue wavelet light, when it hits your eyes, you know, that will also, I will talk about that also, that how this melatonin get affected by constant uh, looking at white light LED screens, especially on your phone uh, or your computer, you know, kind of late in the night. Okay, so again, that's why I want to, to discuss about pineal gland and also melatonin. Here is a structure of your neuronal cells. Okay, now neuron, neuro, uh, neuron is basically, uh, it's, uh, it transmits signal from uh, one neuron to, uh, or, or I would say it transmits, uh, you know, uh, message from brain to periphery and from periphery to brain. Okay, so these are basically messenger cells. Uh, it is uh, made up of, uh, you know, your dendrites. So you can see this uh, uh, dendrites, which are like tree-like uh, structures. Okay, so each neuron has multiple dendrite. Uh, then in the middle, it's your stoma. Okay, uh, that's your neuronal, uh, you know, your uh, stoma over your body. Uh, so uh, and then it has. Uh, basically your uh, you know your axons okay now there's only one axon but there are multiple dendrite okay and this one in the picture is shown the synapses synapses mean uh, you know when your uh, uh, dendrite uh, get connected to axon of the other uh, you know your other uh, neuron uh, that's called your uh, synapses okay and this is how they transmit uh, messages okay so through exon uh, basically that's electric uh, current going in but at the junction at post synaptic and pre synaptic junction there is a chemical messengers okay and that's where uh, I'm going to discuss more about your uh, neurotransmitters which get uh, kind of you know uh, transferred from pre synapses to post synapses Okay, so these neurotransmitters are very important uh, in many of our uh, uh, bodily functions. So here, let's talk about, let's see the video. This is really good. Uh, it will show us exactly. The human brain is composed of a network of billions of neuronal connections. This network enables us to move, communicate, and remember. Its formation starts with the birth of neurons and their migration to the brain region where they will function. After reaching this region, neurons form two types of extensions, dendrites and axons. Dendrites are tree-like structures that receive synaptic inputs from thousands of other neurons. While neurons can generate multiple dendrites, they mostly form only one axon. Axons carry information from the neuron to other cells located in or outside the brain. 
axons often grow over a long distance to contact their target cells. Their path is determined by guidance proteins. Guidance proteins either repel or attract growing axons. They're detected by a hand-like structure at the axon's leading tip, the growth cone. Different proteins act together to guide each individual axon to its final target. During a large part of its journey, an axon may converge with other axons into large bundles. Analogous to a car changing lanes on the highway, the position of an axon within a bundle changes during its journey. This position is regulated by guidance proteins present in the bundle and determines which part of a specific brain region the axon will enter. Once an axon reaches its synaptic target region, it selects its target cell from among thousands of other cells on the basis of the expression of specific molecular labels. Similar labels direct axons to specific parts of the cell, where synaptic contacts are generated. Synapses convey information from one cell to another. There's uh, one more which is a really uh, good, uh, you know, understanding of your uh, exons and dendrite. In the last module, we took first steps towards understanding the electrical properties of individual neurons. We learned how electrical forces and diffusion give rise to membrane potentials. And we learned how cells can generate and propagate signals called action potentials, or spikes, along the membrane. Understanding the properties of the neuronal membrane is essential. But understanding just these properties isn't sufficient to give us insight into collective behavior of the billions of connected neurons in our brains. Luckily for us, we can approach neuroscience at many different scales and levels of analysis, and we don't have to confront the full complexity of everything all at once. That's what we'll be exploring throughout the rest of this course as we slowly go from our understanding of single molecules, such as ion channels, to the electrical behavior of neurons, to their collective behavior in small circuits, and finally onto how they become organized in large functional regions of the brain. Let's start simple though. Since we've examined one neuron, a logical next question is how do two neurons connect with one another? We'll first examine some basic cellular anatomy of neurons. So far, we haven't made too much of the fact that the majority of neurons are polarized cells. That is, they have one portion of the cell for receiving inputs and another portion for sending outputs. The parts of the cells that are specialized for receiving inputs from other cells are called dendrites. The word dendrite comes from the Greek word dendron, meaning tree, and as you can see, the dendrites have a branching, tree-like structure. A signal received by a dendrite is passed to the cell body. If there is sufficient depolarization of the cell body membrane to initiate an action potential, then an action potential is sent down the axon. The axon then carries the propagating action potential to another neuron. So what actually happens at the boundary between two neurons, between the axon of one neuron and the dendrite of another? This interface is called a synapse. There are two general types of synapses. Electrical synapses and chemical synapses. Electrical synapses are less common in our own nervous systems, but they're simpler to think about, so let's start with them. Electrical synapses are basically pores between two cells that allow ions to pass through. They allow the passage of the electrical signal through to a neighboring cell without much fuss. It's not so different than just combining two cells into one larger cell. There are lots of reasons that nature might need synapses like this from time to time. They're fast and they allow cells to couple together with a high degree of synchronicity. But most neurons are connected together by a much more complicated structure called a chemical synapse. 
in a chemical synapse, rather than simply passing along an electrical signal from one cell to another, the action potential travels to the end of the axon and causes a chemical to be released into a very small space between the two neurons called the synaptic cleft. This chemical is taken up by the downstream neuron on the other side of the cleft. This chemical signal can cause the downstream neuron to depolarize its membrane, converting the chemical signal back into an electrical one. Or it can have other effects on the cell. This chemical step is slower than transmission across an electrical synapse, but it opens up an enormously diverse repertoire of different and more complex kinds of signaling. And synaptic function plays a critical role in computations performed by neurons. We'll spend the rest of this unit exploring the inner workings of chemical synapses on our way to beginning to look at how networks of interconnected neurons give rise to behavior. We'll also look at the role of defective synaptic physiology in neurological and psychiatric disorders, and we'll see how synapses can be targeted by various psychoactive drugs and poisons. Finally, we'll wrap up by looking at how synapses can change over time in response to external stimuli, playing a foundational role in how we learn and remember. Okay, so that was a really good animation just to understand. So again, uh, coming back to uh, slides. Uh, so what, you know that brain is made up of, uh, and spinal cord made up of gray matter and white matter, you know. Uh, gray matter is actually the, uh, you know, if you look at this uh, uh, slide, uh, you know, this is a cross section of brain. The outer layer, the outer margin is, is darker. Okay, and as you see, uh, it becomes kind of more pale uh, in color. So that the inner part is called white matter, the outer uh, edge is called gray matter. Okay, now why there is color difference? And if you look at uh, spinal cord, it's it's other way around. Your gray matter is inside, and your white matter is outside. Okay, that's in spinal cord. So gray matter is primarily composed of neuronal somas, the round central cell bodies. And white matter is mostly made up of axons, axons which I showed you that long line, those are axons, long stems that connect neuronal together. Uh, it is wrapped in myelin, so that myelin, uh, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, what myelin is, uh, it is a protective coating uh, of the axon. The different composition of neuron part is why the two appears as separate shades in certain areas, okay, uh, in certain scans. So this is basically your gray matter is your, your neuronal soma, okay, uh, which is your main body and uh, white matter is your axons, okay. Now here is your, uh, uh, you know, slide that I wanted to show you. Uh, if you can see the, on the left side, there is this uh, nerve cells that I've shown and here uh, you can see that there is a covering on the exon that is a myelin and myelin is predominantly made up of fat, okay. Uh, myelination occurs uh, literally from, uh, you know, last trimester onward and it continues uh, till uh, two years of age, uh, but it's important then to maintain that myelin sheet, okay. Uh, and as myelin starts getting deposited, you start seeing function in in the baby, okay. Uh, so because different parts, uh, different parts of brain develop myelin at a different uh, in different phases. Uh, here you can see, uh, you know, you can see the dendrite, which are a branch-like structure. You can see one line, uh, like a, you know, uh, one structure axon, which is one in number, okay, and then that basically connects with another uh, dendrite. Uh, you know, uh, with other cell. And here is the synapses. Uh, synapses means uh, there is a connection between uh, two neurons, okay. And you can see the vesicle, vesicle uh, in the neurons, they carry neurotransmitters, that is chemical messengers, okay. And they basically come towards the edge and then it releases the uh, vesicle and neurotransmitters get released in the uh, area between two neurons, okay. Uh, and you have receptors on the other side which will accept this uh, neurotransmitters and will create a chemical reaction uh, and through that the message, message will pass through, 
okay so this is your uh, you know basically your synapses uh, neurotransmitters what are they they are chemical messengers that uh, your body cannot function without okay uh, so i will also talk about some of the important neurotransmitters uh, their job is to carry a uh, chemical signal uh, or messages from one neuron to next target okay it could be next target could be another neuronal cell it could be muscle cell it could be gland it could be anything okay so uh, but you know that message message needs to be passed on so that message passes on through synapses okay uh, neurotransmitters what do they control in our body it controls heartbeat blood pressure breathing muscle movement uh it controls uh, thoughts memory learning and feelings uh it also controls sleep uh, your healing your aging uh it controls your stress response uh, digestion sense of hunger thirst i mean think about it it's, it's all about you know how to keep those neurotransmitters in good shape then you will be in the wellness stage right uh, or you will be in a preventive health mode uh senses response to what you see hear feel touch and taste okay so these are all basically uh, controlled by neurotransmitters in our body uh, what are the different types of neurotransmitters so you have basically uh, glutamate you have gamma amino uh, butyric acid which is also called gaba uh, glycine you know uh, there are many more i'll discuss further but uh, let's discuss a little bit detail about this three uh, neurotransmitters glutamate gaba and glycine okay uh, these are basically our amino acids uh, glutamate plays a role in cognitive function uh, it like thinking learning memory uh, imbalances in glutamate uh, associated with alzheimer's disease dementia parkinson's disease convulsions uh, gaba it regulates brain activity to prevent problem in area of anxiety irritability concentration sleep seizures and uh, depression okay and your glycine is most uh, common inhibitory neurotransmitters uh, it is uh, it is present mainly in your spinal cord it is involved in controlling hearing process pain transmission and metabolism okay uh, then there are more neurotransmitters uh, you, definitely serotonin is very common you must have heard about serotonin and dopamine of course uh, and then you have a histamine okay now serotonin it, uh, it also called uh, joy you know hor uh, neurotransmitters for joy you know uh, it helps regulate mood it regulates sleep pattern sexuality anxiety appetite and pain okay and disease associated with serotonin imbalance includes seasonal affective disorder anxiety depression fibromyalgia and chronic pain okay uh, that's your serotonin many times we think that serotonin uh, and a lot of these neurotransmitters are made in brain but many of them then are made in your gut okay uh, so that you won't remember uh, histamine uh, regulates body functions including wakefulness uh, feeding behavior motivation it plays a role in uh, asthma bronchospasm mucosal edema and multiple sclerosis so what happens is many time when you have allergy you know uh, say allergy to uh, mosquito allergy to bee sting or something bit you or something you ate uh, in that area uh, histamine gets released and histamine gives you this uh, you know inflammatory reaction right you know, you will get a redness you'll get some pain you'll get itchiness that's your histamine release and that's the reaction that histamine has uh, on the skin sometimes you have a lot of bron bronchospasm you know when you have uh, kind of uh, you know uh, like sudden uh, contraction uh, of your bronchus okay so that's your bronchospasm uh, then you have dopamine uh, dopamine is basically it plays a role in body's reward system which include feeling pleasure achieving heightened arousal and learning dopamine also helps with focus concentration memory sleep mood motivation uh, disease associated with this function of dopamine system includes parkinsons schizophrenia bipolar lot of this uh, conditions you know adhd very common in uh, students even older students uh, many uh, highly addictive drugs like your cocaine methamphetamine amphetamine they act directly on dopamine system dopamine uh, hormone is also called pleasure neurotransmitter uh, some of the foods are addicting 
okay so like for example sugar sugar is very addicting and it attacks on the dopamine it releases dopamine okay in the uh, in a synapses so you want to uh, and you know that you know when we have tea we are not addicted to tea we are addicted to sugar actually you know and sugar has a lot more effects uh, tobacco uh, also affects your dopamine so there are all these uh, so many addicting uh, you know uh, things there are other things like uh, you know be on social media is addicting you know uh, sometime watching uh, pornography is addiction so there are all these you know addictions and they, those are all basically uh, working on your dopamine okay then you have a epinephrine norepinephrine epinephrine also called as adrenaline and norepinephrine also uh, they are responsible for so called fight or flight response fight or flight is means if there is any danger you know uh, this uh, adrenaline really rushes in and makes you help make a decision faster and immediately causes reflex action right uh, and then this neurotransmitter stimulates your body's response by increasing your heart rate uh, breathing blood pressure blood sugar blood flow to your muscles okay so it basically releases all this uh, uh, different things uh, it also heightens attention and focus to allow you to act or react to different stresses so it makes you kind of hyper vigilant okay so that you know you are kind of focused on that stress or any triggering factor and then your body will react okay so that's what the function of epinephrine uh, too much epinephrine can lead to high blood pressure diabetes heart disease so again epinephrine and norepinephrine i'll come back again when i'm talking about stress okay because when you have chronic stress it does affect your heart it affects your blood pressure it affects your uh, blood glucose level okay uh, norepinephrine is your uh, also called as noradrenaline uh, it increases blood pressure and heart rate it's most widely known for its effect on alertness arousal decision making attention and focus many medications uh, like st stimulant and depression medications aim to increase norepinephrine to improve focus and concentration uh, and this is specifically true in to treat adhd or to modulate uh, norepinephrine to improve depression symptoms okay so for depression sometimes uh, you know many doctors they recommend uh, uh, you know drugs which has norepinephrine then you have something called endorphins okay endorphins are uh, body's natural pain reliever and they play a role in perception of pain uh, and release of endorphin reduces pain as well as causes feel good feeling uh, acetylcholine is released by most neurons in your autonomic nervous system which regulate your heart rate blood pressure and gut motility okay so autonomic nervous system means uh, you know uh, you don't have any uh, control on that right so basically your heartbeat you know you don't you don't control your heartbeat in a sense that you can't tell heart to stop pumping or you know uh, you know of course there are some reactions which will which your mind will control for example uh, if you suddenly get panicky or if you suddenly uh, get scared uh, your, your mind will control will release your neurotransmitter epinephrine and that will increase your heart rate but that's through mind you don't have direct control like for example uh, with skeletal muscles you know uh, like your muscles you have a direct control you can tell finger to kind of you know extend or flex you know that's your direct control uh, of you know your uh, muscle uh, so uh, in autonomic nervous system uh, those muscles are smooth muscles those are not skeletal muscles and basically it is governed by autonomic nervous system okay so your heart rate your blood pressure your gut motility uh, those are all your uh, you know uh, autonomic nervous system so acetylcholine plays a role in muscle contraction memory motivation sexual desire sleep and learning imbalance in acetylcholine level are linked with health issue like alzheimer's disease convulsion muscle spasms uh, all that okay so again remember that when you are uh, exercising you are basically you know uh, uh, looking at acetylcholine uh, here is another uh, beautiful uh, video that will show which shows the 3d effect of chemical synapses basically a chemical synapse is a special junction between two neurons that allows them to communicate without being physically connected a synapse has several structures the presynaptic neuron ends in a small bulb called a presynaptic terminal 
The postsynaptic terminal membrane is directly adjacent, separated by a small space called the synaptic cleft. An action potential causes voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open in the presynaptic terminal. The influx of calcium ions prompts synaptic vesicles to release neurotransmitters via exocytosis. This neuron is releasing acetylcholine. The neurotransmitter quickly diffuses across the synaptic cleft. Two acetylcholine molecules bind with one ligand-gated sodium channel at the postsynaptic membrane, opening the channel. When enough sodium ion channels open, the postsynaptic cell depolarizes and the action potential continues along the neuron. So that was your uh, chemical synapses. Here, basically, uh, again, just one slide that I put, which I really liked. And it shows that, uh, you know, uh, what happens when you have food which is high in sugar or high bad fats and how it damages your hippocampal uh, campus area, okay? So, uh, again, I'll come back to this uh, when we're talking about uh, gut microbiome and, you know, how it affects the neurons. Uh, but uh, as I said that uh, everything has effect. Okay, uh, so you want to be, uh, again, be kind of vigilant of what kind of food you eat because it will eventually cause a neurotransmitter problem. Okay, okay. This is another very good uh, video again on chemical synapses. So uh, just have a look, it's a small one. Uh, also, this is on, uh, you know, addiction, uh, specifically for dopamine. Okay. So I want you to watch this and understand that what exactly uh, addiction does to our dopamine receptors. The brain is central to our existence. It generates everything we feel and do. It processes information coming from the outside world, such as the smell of food, and from inside the body, such as sensations of hunger. Using all this information, the brain then makes an appropriate response driving behaviors that help us survive. For example, getting something to eat. Deep within the brain is a set of structures called the limbic system. The limbic system lies below the cortex, or outer layer of the brain. In evolutionary terms, the limbic system is quite old compared with the cortex. One limbic system structure, the hippocampus, helps us form memories and learn. The amygdala contributes to emotions. The striatum is crucial to forming habits, routines of behavior that we tend to do without thinking, and processing reward. The limbic system contains the brain's reward circuit or pathway. The reward circuit links together a number of brain structures that control and regulate our ability to feel pleasure. Feeling pleasure motivates us to repeat behaviors, such as eating, and other actions that are critical to our existence. A reward, or something linked with a reward, activates cells in the ventral tegmental area, or VTA, in the midbrain. This sets off a chain reaction of activation in the reward circuit. The long projections of VTA cells go to an area called the ventral striatum, or VS. The activation of cells quickly reaches a key part of the VS called the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is often called the brain's pleasure center. When activated, each cell generates an electrical signal. That electrical signal causes the cell to release molecules of neurotransmitter, which act as chemical messengers. Those chemical messages are received by another cell. This is how cells communicate with each other in an activated neural circuit. The brain has many different neurotransmitters, which serve multiple functions. The small gap between the sending and receiving cells is called the synapse. The cell sending the message is presynaptic, the receiving cell postsynaptic. In the presynaptic cell, the electrical signal causes changes. Some packets or vesicles that store neurotransmitter migrate to the cell membrane, merge with it, open up, and release neurotransmitter molecules into the synapse. In the reward pathway, 
dopamine neurons release the neurotransmitter dopamine. The released dopamine molecules drift across the synapse. They link up with proteins called dopamine receptors on the surface of the receiving cell. These receptors span the receiving cell's membrane, with part on the outside and part on the inside of the cell. When dopamine binds in the receptor's exterior part, like a key into a lock, it triggers a cascade of events inside the receiving cell. Other proteins attached to the interior part of the receptor carry the signal onward within the cell. When there is excess dopamine, and as these molecules drop off receptors, they are free in the synapse again. Some dopamine molecules re-enter the sending cell via a special protein called a dopamine transporter on the sending cell's membrane. Back inside the cell, these dopamine molecules are now available for re-release. In a healthy brain, there is always a moderate level of dopamine in the synaptic space, even in the absence of rewarding stimuli. When a reward is encountered, such as food, the presynaptic cell releases a larger amount of dopamine in a sudden burst. Dopamine transporters will then quickly remove the excess, returning the amount of dopamine to the original level. Dopamine surges in response to natural rewards help the brain learn, adapt, and navigate a complex world. Normal cycling of dopamine release occurs in the VS, activating the entire striatum and limbic areas. Activation of the reward pathway has a far-reaching impact throughout the brain. From the VS, the reward pathway extends to the prefrontal cortex, or PFC. The PFC powers our ability to think, plan, solve problems, and make decisions. The reward system influences the limbic system and the areas of the cortex that process sensory and motor information. Reward system activation also influences the cerebellum in the back of the brain, which affects coordination of movement as well as attention. Normal activation of the reward system creates a physical imprint on the brain that links certain stimuli with rewards that satisfy biological needs, such as food, and make us want to fulfill those needs by seeking out those rewards. Once the brain associates a stimulus with a reward, just seeing the stimulus can trigger a surge of dopamine in the reward system. When someone first uses cocaine, the drug quickly enters the brain where it blocks the transporters on the presynaptic cell. Since dopamine cannot re-enter the presynaptic cell, it begins to accumulate in the synapse, where it can reach abnormally high levels and remain there much longer than usual. The postsynaptic cell becomes hyperactivated, which produces a feeling of euphoria. This creates an incredibly powerful association between cocaine and pleasure, making a person want to repeat the experience of taking the drug. When someone first uses methamphetamine, the drug quickly enters the brain. At low doses, meth blocks the re-entry of dopamine into the presynaptic cell, just like cocaine does. But unlike cocaine, higher doses of meth can increase the release of dopamine from the cell leading to much, much more dopamine in the synapse, where it becomes trapped because meth prevents the transporters from removing it. Because so much dopamine remains in the synapse for such long periods of time, the postsynaptic cell is activated to dangerously high levels, causing the user to experience powerful feelings of euphoria, making meth incredibly addictive. Using cocaine or meth has far-reaching consequences on the brain. Drugs alter how the reward center communicates with the rest of the brain, affecting emotions, movement, reasoning, and decision-making. The repeated, frequent use of these drugs can change the actual wiring throughout the brain. 
these changes will eventually prevent a chronic user from feeling the same euphoria they experienced when first using the drug. Instead, they need to take the drug just to feel normal, and they feel compelled to take it, no matter the consequences. This is when chronic drug use becomes an addiction. Okay, so that was you learnt about addiction, what happens in addiction and how, uh, you know, dopamine surge uh, causes uh, euphoria and, uh, you know, uh, people get addicted to that euphoria. Euphoria means feeling really good, feeling really happy and feeling really good. That's called euphoria. Okay, and here on this slide, uh, you know, it just, uh, uh, it just shows that what all conditions can be uh, you know, I have shown the slide, uh, which we can show. Uh, it shows, uh, you know, what all conditions are associated with the uh, neurotransmitter issues, you know. So, there are like, you know, multiple, multiple conditions which can cause due to neurotransmitter issues. Now, I'm going to talk about immune system. Of course, you know, this nervous system, I'll keep coming back uh, when I'm talking about exercise and stress and sleep and all that, you know, it all, everything has effect on uh, brain. Uh, but I now I want to talk about immune system because, you know, uh, like, you know, for two years, last two, three years, we were at home uh, because obviously we were worried about uh, getting infection, COVID-19 infection. Uh, and, you know, uh, if only we had uh, full control of our immune system, you know, we would not have uh, had so much of panic okay so how to keep your immune system healthy uh, what to do but before that i want to again get into more of understanding what are what are immune cells what is t cells what are b cells what are their functions you know so all that i think we need to understand because uh, once i start talking about food and other different ways to improve your immunity uh, you know you need to uh, know that what i'm talking about okay so basically your uh, immune system uh, you have something called antigen okay this antigen could be your bacteria it could be virus it could be dust particle it could be anything those are antigen okay uh, and you have uh, so antigens are present basically on all these different uh, it could be uh, parasites it could be anything right then what happens is you have your cells you have something called b cells which is a lymphocytes which releases your antibodies okay so your antibodies um, also immunoglobulins they all are produced by b cells okay and then b cells uh, those antibodies attack those antigen and then basically try to kill it okay then you have some specialized cells which eats this uh, antigen so basically it's like you know it, it takes up those antigen and basically try to uh, you know uh, eat it up okay so you have this antigen antibody and lymphocytes uh, phagocyte cells, you know, which uh, I've shown, they destroy viral and bacterial antigen by eating them. While B cell produce antibodies, okay, which bind to uh, an inactivate antigen. Okay, so one thing is inactivating antigen by binding to it, which is your B cell, okay, through immunoglobulin, and you have another one which are T cells. Now T cells the main function is basically they eat up. They eat up. They they produce lot more different cells you know and their job is to eat up those bacteria and then destroy them okay okay now here is the uh, uh, other one which uh, i'm going to discuss so you have uh, acquired immunity okay uh, acquired immunity mean, means you have immunity against specific viruses specific bacteria okay so suppose you got a bacterial infection okay now this particular bacterial infection two things will happen one thing that the b cells okay which produces your antibodies will get activated okay and those activated b cells will have uh, either it will produce the memory b cells memory means that b cell is going to now remember that oh this is the bacteria which had come last time so those memory cells now are activated and will basically in inactivate those bacterial cells okay or you may have uh, B cells producing antibodies, okay. So, the antibodies are producing B cells which are your plasma cells, okay. They start producing uh, antibodies which gets bind to antigen and it produces 
antigen antibody complexes okay and this are this is called humoral immunity humoral immunity is through your b cells okay by producing your immunoglobulins and your uh, your uh, uh, antibodies okay that's your humoral antibodies or humoral immunity then similarly your t cells also get activated the t cells are the cells okay which basically engulf bacteria engulf virus okay so now let's see what happens in your t cells so first of all your macrophage gets activated okay uh, and it basically process antigen fragments and then uh, they produce something called helper t cells okay then helper t cells uh, can do two things either it will stimulate b cells or it will basically activate t cells okay and this two t cells what it will do it will basically uh, uh, create something called cytotoxic t cell which is a killer t cell it will it will kill your uh, bacteria and also it will create something called memory t cells okay memory t cells mean it will remember that okay this was a bacteria which had come this is how to kill it so next time when you have reinfection with the same bacteria your memory cells come uh, you know immediately and it will immediately will uh, kill your bacteria okay so that is your cell mediated immunity so you have a cell mediated Im immunity which is basically uh, uh, function through your t cells and then you have humoral immunity which is through antibodies and immunoglobulin production which is through your b cells okay so remember this names your humoral immunity and your uh, your cell mediated immunity okay okay now this is the picture of your t cell okay so you can see that uh, t cells basically engulf your uh, bacteria or viruses okay uh, here is a cytotoxic t cell so remember i told you that uh, these are killer cells okay so what does it do it basically recognize antigen uh, on the surface of the cell infected with a virus and it enables a t cell to bind and kill the infected cell so cytotoxic cell is more like a uh, i would say uh, you know it it looks at the cell it sees that which cell has the uh, in, are infected and it will guide t cells to go there and then basically uh, you know bind to those infected cells and kill those cells okay uh, then you have something called macrophage now i keep talking about macrophage uh, on and off uh, macrophage are the large cells macro means large uh, you know and these are large cells which uh, the principal phagocytic cells uh, engulf uh, you know component of the immune system and their what is their role they engulf those bacteria they engulf that uh, viruses in ingest and destroy foreign particles such as bacteria okay so here uh, this is a structure of macrophages uh, you will also i will also talk about macrophages in uh, cardiovascular diseases like how it engulfs those uh, you know uh, cholesterol particles okay then you have something called cloning cloning of uh, b cells so when b cells basically find out that there is a uh, you know a bacterial invasion or viral inv invasion then the b cell starts cloning so they they multiply so when you look at your blood test many times they'll say oh your blood counts are high you know uh, that means you have infection that means this cloning is happening okay and in that cloning basically you know once the cloning starts it's basically it's like a police force becoming strong and trying to uh, kill the bacteria or the uh, viruses okay and that's called cloning okay uh, this is the structure of your immunoglobulins okay uh, you have five different kind of immunoglobulins you have igg you have iga you have igd ige and ig uh, m okay ig so again a uh, iga ige m e and d okay so these are the five uh, immunoglobulins that uh, our b cells produce uh, this is a very beautiful uh, very quick very funny video that i want to show because in just a matter of few minutes it gives you understanding of different cells and how they function how they get activated and how they kill all the bacteria viruses etc okay so just have fun watching our this. body has a powerful army that protects it from various types of threats these threats can come in the form of mechanical injuries the entry of germs or the entry of other foreign particles like dust this personal army is called the immune system
Every day, we encounter a huge number of bacteria, viruses, and other disease-causing organisms. However, we don't fall ill every other day, which is due to our immune system, an army of cells that is always roaming our body, ready to ward off any attack. The immune system can be broadly divided into two parts, innate and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity, or nonspecific immunity, is the body's first natural defense to any intruder. This system doesn't care what it's killing. Its primary goal is to prevent any intruder from entering the body, and if it does enter, then the immune system neutralizes this intruder. It doesn't differentiate between one pathogen and another. The first component of this defensive system is our skin. Any organism trying to get into the body is stopped by the skin, our largest organ, which covers us. Secondly, there is the mucus lining of all our organs. The sticky, viscous fluid traps any pathogens trying to get past it. These are the two physical barriers. However, we also have chemical barriers, such as the lysozyme in the eyes, or the acid in the stomach, which can kill pathogens trying to gain entry. The genitourinary tract and other places have their own normal flora or microbial community. These compete with pathogens for space and food, and therefore also act as a barrier. The next line of defense is inflammation, which is done by mast cells. These cells are constantly searching for suspicious objects in the body. When they find something, they release a signal in the form of histamine molecules. These alert the body, and blood is rushed to the problem area. This causes inflammation and also brings leukocytes, or white blood cells, which are soldiers in our body's cellular army. Once they come, all hell breaks loose. Sometimes, however, the intruder may not be a germ, but rather a harmless thing like a dust particle. The body still causes a full immune reaction to this intruder, which is how allergic reactions occur. In the fortress of our body, the leukocytes are VIPs. They have an all-access pass to the body, except, of course, to the brain and spinal cord. Our leukocytes come in many types. Those that belong to the innate system are the phagocytes. These cells can either patrol your body, like the neutrophils, or they can stay in certain places and wait for their cue. Neutrophils are the most abundant cells. They patrol the body and can therefore get to a breach site very quickly. These cellular soldiers kill the infectious cell and then die, which leads to the formation of pus. There are also the big bad wolves, or the macrophages. These cells are like hungry, ravenous monsters who simply engulf unwanted pathogens. Instead of roaming freely in our blood, they are collected in certain places. These cells can consume about 100 pathogens before they die, but they can also detect our own cells that have gone rogue, such as cancer cells, and kill them too. Beyond that, we also have the natural killer cells. These cells can efficiently detect when our own cells have gone rogue, or are infected with, say, a virus. NKCs detect a protein produced by normal cells called the major histocompatibility complex, or MHC. Basically, whenever a cell isn't normal, it stops producing this protein. The NKCs move around constantly, checking our cells for this type of deficiency. And when they find an abnormal cell, they simply bind to it, release chemicals, and destroy it. The last cells of our innate immune system are the dendritic cells. These are found in places that come in contact with the outside environment such as the nose and lungs. They are the link between our innate and adaptive immune systems. They eat a pathogen and then carry information about it to our adaptive immune system cells. This information is produced and shared in the form of antigens. Antigens are the traces that pathogens leave behind. They are molecules found on the surface of pathogens that can be detected by our adaptive immune system for recognition. The dendritic cells pass on this information to our T cells. However, macrophages can also perform this function. Now, there is also the adaptive or acquired immune system. This system is more efficient as it can differentiate between different types of pathogens. It has two main components, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. T cells come into play when an infection has already occurred, thus bringing about the cell-mediated immune response. B cells join the fight when the pathogens have entered, but haven't yet caused any disease. This is called the humoral immune response. 
Some T cells take signals from the dendritic cells or macrophages and are thus called helper T cells. They perform two key tasks, forming effector T cells, which are basically cells that cycle through the body and call in the cavalry, namely other white blood cells. Helper T cells also form memory T cells, which keep a record of this antigen for future reference. Sometimes, some cells of our body know that they have lost the battle. They have become heavily infected with pathogens, so there is no hope left for them. At this point, the immune system brings out the cytotoxic T cells. These cells rush over and perform a mercy killing for the infected and dying cell. Furthermore, we have the B cells. They produce chemicals called antibodies, which fit on the antigens of pathogens, much like how a lock and key fit together. These antibodies crowd around a pathogen and act like tags. They signal the macrophages to come and kill the marked pathogen. B cells also produce memory B cells when they encounter an antigen. The B and T memory cells jointly maintain a record of all encountered infections and thus strengthen and solidify the body's immune response to these infections in the future. Our innate response is quicker, though nonspecific. It gets into action within hours and is pretty strong. However, when things get out of hand, the innate system calls for help from the acquired immune system. This system can take days to mount a response, but the next time we encounter that pathogen, it won't make us get sick. In short, every day that we spend being healthy is all thanks to our immune system, so it definitely deserves our respect. Okay. Here is like the last slide that I have. I've just shown exactly, you know, which cell gets stimulated, uh, you know, uh, all the different kind of cells I've shown. Uh, you have already seen it in your videos. So I'm not going to repeat it. But basically, uh, it's important to, I have not, this is just a basic that I have explained. Uh, there, are, there is much more to immunity. Uh, and to have a good metabolic health is extremely important to have this uh, proper functioning of cells, you know. Uh, because when you have uh, uh, insulin resistance, if you have diabetes, pre-diabetes, any of those conditions, you know, your immune cells will not function optimally and then you will be at risk of uh, infection. In fact, uh, if you remember, you know, COVID-19 was much more severe in patients who had metabolic disorders, okay? So, uh, you want to make sure that you stay metabolically healthy and keep your immune system uh, well and hearty so that, you know, you don't get uh, any of those infections, okay? Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next session.